having said all that, Kath, who do we have? We've got back by popular demand Russ Baker, the editor in chief of the website who what why dot org. Uh, the hurricanes and Stephen Paddock had knocked it off the front pages, but Russ is here to put Russia Gate back on the front page. Welcome back to the show, Russ. Thank you. Always glad to do it. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm sure that, yeah, well, I actually have seen that uh, you reprise a story on your website on the uh, anniversary of the um, University of Texas massacre in 1966 in the wake oh, yeah. of that horrible I read, I read, Las Vegas story. I read that. That's uh the the, the uh, what's the, the two days? The fifty year anniversary is the year that people can carry concealed weapons on campus. Isn't that yeah. special? Uh huh. I mean, knew that, Matty. That, that's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It was August first, twenty sixteen. What? Uh, welcome to Texas. Yeah, welcome to Texas. Um, but uh, but we haven't talked about Russia Gate in a while, Russ. And we were hoping uh, you could tell us things like who is Michael Cohen, who's Felix Sater, why do we care about them? Sure, and, and if, I, if I may, I'd just like to tie together a bunch of themes here. Uh, as you mentioned, I um, am the well, I'm the founder and the editor-in-chief of a news website called whowhatwhy.org. We're a nonprofit organization, and we don't accept any advertising. And the reason we're structured that way is because we want to do a kind of journalism that I personally felt I couldn't always do when I was working at some of the larger uh, establishment Entities, uh, and I hope you don't mind if I just frame this, and then Go ahead. I think it'll be interesting for listeners as we get into the particular issues we'll talk about. Uh, you know, everybody talks about fake news, and of course, there really is a problem with fake news and growing evidence that the Russians have sort of mastered the ability to manipulate large sectors of our population into believing things that simply are not true. Uh, and that is a very, very real issue that it, who, what, why we're greatly concerned about. But we're also concerned about another kind of fake news, and that's the fake news that comes out of the establishment. It's a different kind of fake news. It's much more subtle. Uh, so, for example, you'll see uh, about a week ago we did a piece by uh, James Galbraith, the son of John F. Kennedy's uh, advisor uh, and the economist uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. And he writes about uh, how... Uh, the uh, Vietnam War uh, that, that Kennedy actually was trying to get out of Vietnam when he was killed. And this story has been suppressed by the uh, traditional media. Uh, and now, you know, PBS had a big, very interesting documentary series about the history of Vietnam, which is all well and good, but it leaves out this absolutely critical point. So there are a lot of things going on where we're not really understanding the full uh, uh, context of what is happening, and I think that applies to some of the things you just mentioned. I think it applies to uh, Russia Gate, and I'm happy to talk about that. I think it applies to uh, things that are going on under the Trump administration. I think it applies to U.S. foreign policy. I think it applies to almost everything, and, and I know that your show focuses a lot on uh, helping people manage their money and make good, uh, sound investments. And, of course, to really be a smart investor, you have to be well-informed. And you have to understand what's really going on. And I think we're kind of in a crisis uh, right now because we're not sure what's real and we're not sure what actually is going on. Uh, and I think that's kind of the, the subtext behind all of these stories. So if we talk about the, the shootings in Las Vegas, uh, I mean, that's just a, such an astonishing story. Are we ever going to find out what really made this man go off the rails like that? I'm going to say no. Because at Hua Hawaii, we talk about the fact that in case after case after case, we don't seem to ever get the real story. Uh, we get some kind of a superficial treatment. And you mentioned this, the shooting long ago in Texas. Uh, a man climbed a tower at the University of Texas in Austin uh, and with a rifle, and he began just picking off random people. Uh, that story is just almost completely forgotten, and now Texas allows uh, concealed carry, you know, practically any nut can carry uh, a gun, and not just carry a gun, they can carry them on some of the uh, college campuses there. <laughs> you know, you just got to think about the insanity uh, of where we're headed. So all of these stories, uh, moving over to uh, to Russiagate. Russ, can uh, I, can I, Russ, can I interrupt you for a second? You uh, just, uh, I, by the way, I, I love the theme you're hearing. My, my question is, was it six months ago, a year ago? So, you know, you'll know this, I don't. Uh, Britain came out with that huge review. No, it was late. Uh, it was supposed to have been done a couple of years ago or whatever of their involvement in Iraq and it was a scathing indictment on their people and ours. Now, Brits are, maybe they've been around longer. I'm not saying they're perfect. They're not. Uh, seem, some of these other countries seem a little more shall we say, uh, introspective, retrospective on things like this instead of just 
forgetting about all the bad stuff, forgetting all the stupid stuff we did in Vietnam, you know, maybe figuring out who the hell killed Kennedy. I mean, who knows what that one. But I'm saying, why do we just keep moving forward with these with these wounds open, and we don't we don't seem it seems like it's our culture to just keep walking forward, covered up, and keep going. And never. Why is that? I mean, are we going to grow out of that someday, or what's the deal? Tom, that is such a good question. The best way that I've been able to answer it for myself, and I'm, I'm still thinking about this, of course, and thinking about it all the time, is that there's something in the way that our culture has been constructed, and I, I, I don't think it's any of us as individuals, but it has been constructed either willfully or accidentally, uh, to the point where we're really not supposed to ask too many questions. And we also have kind of a thing where none of us are supposed to really make waves, and we're not really supposed to sort of question orthodoxies or deeper truths. And what it really comes down to is we get told, shush, Uh, you know, that's too upsetting. People can't handle that. And that, I think, is the really, really dangerous thing, because the United States has imposed on much of the world the demand that they remember. I mean, look uh, look at Germany. Germany has has done such a good job of teaching its people what happened in World War II, uh, how the Nazis came to power, and and instituted all kinds of measures to make sure that could never happen again. It is a completely different country uh, as a result of that. Um, And you see that again and again, what you're talking about, this kind of reflection. Uh, Latin America, they had all those truth commissions, uh, Argentina, Chile, and everything, to see what had happened, that their countries had gone so bad uh, down the uh, drain of uh, authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Uh, But in the United States, we, as you say, we never seem to sort of take stock. Uh, I did a book, uh, you've had me on to talk about it, called Family of Secrets, where I did a kind of a, uh, you might call it a post-mortem on the Bush dynasty, and I looked back at this family that had been either president or vice president for 12 out of 20 years uh, to try to figure out what that family was about, and of course the Iraq War came out of that and so many other things, uh, and what I found was, oh my gosh, there's a whole other history that we've never been told. So. It's partly that we don't want to talk about these things, but it's also partly that we don't even know about what really happened. Is it just, is it, uh, as they used to say on the trading floor, not to be trite, is there so much information it's like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant? Is it, is it part of it? it? You know, it's part of that, but it's also because we don't have enough figures out there who are willing and able to narrate and provide the bigger picture. So let's say you talk about, you mentioned Kennedy. You know, you talk about all these things, you know, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, on and on and on. I mean, there have been so many of these shootings of leaders in the United States. And, of course, the, you know, the way it's handled is every single time it's a one-off, it's some nut, there's no more to it, nothing to see here, folks. I mean, just logically, if you study world history, in almost every case uh, where leaders of countries were removed, there was the hand of other powerful interests. That just makes sense. And, and, and you know, we look at the statistics. In the United States, we are told that every single attempt and successful uh, uh, effort to remove uh, a leader was always a nut, which doesn't make any sense because there's so many powerful forces arrayed. Our country has a long history of going into other countries to remove, often violently, elected leaders. So, logically, there should be an analysis being provided to say, hey, we may not be getting the whole story here. And that, I think, would answer your concern about the fire hose of information, to step back and provide that kind of analysis on the big picture. Well, the question I, when I, when Kath, I asked you to come back on, you came on, the one I absolutely have to ask you, and I don't know if this is one the listeners want me to, but I, I think somehow rightly or wrongly, and part of this came from uh you know, you telling us about the Bush thing and everything. Somehow or another, people have come, I won't say they're comfortable, but they've come to grips with the fact that we're not getting the whole story a lot of places and there's an awful lot of powerful people in this country, and by the way, we're not one of them. I mean, I, somehow or another, I, I, I think people, they don't like it, but they deal with it. I mean, and, and probably people in the rest of the world do as well. Uh, my, my, the, my antenna went up about this pipeline in the, in the, uh, I don't know how many people put two and two together, like I sometimes do to my regret, where they we, we were going to use all American pipe. Well, it turns out we're not going to use American pipe. It's actually been bought from Canada. And, oh, by the way, the guy in Canada who bought who bought part of that company is this oligarch-slash-KGB rich dude, gangman guy from uh, Russia that gave Putin his first nickel to run for in 1991. Now, do you think we're really ready 
and I'm not saying this where this is going, but you know more about this than me, are we really ready to know that, that part of the people that we know have been propping up our politicians for decades now are from another country, both Hillary and Trump probably. Are, we, are you think we're ready for that? I don't know. I mean, it, I don't. I'm not. Well, I, I think the I think the backstory to that is that money talks, and that it's it it's not you know there's always this focus on you know bogeymen you know it's this it's this person it's this group it's this interest or whatever. It doesn't really work that way. The, the, the problem is that we don't take stock of the system and whether the system is truly democratic, if it really is transparent, it really represents our interests. Uh, and I think that what we saw with the Russia thing and what we see with the Trumps is rich people uh, do business with rich people, and the rest of us get screwed. And the people who are getting screwed are the American people and the Russian people. And, you know, it, people, you know, there's a lot of attempt to sort of try to, try to affix blame to, as I say, demographically and so on. I don't think it's about that. I think the problem is systemic, and it's harder for us to get our hands around that systemic. You know, we have a piece up on who, what, why, uh, about the history of these, um, these cartels, these German Nazi cartels, and about the cooperation between American business and these, basically, these Nazi concerns. I mean, Standard Oil, you know, IBM, you know, with IG Farben that supplied these Zyklon B gas for the concentration camps. I mean, there was a double dealing. There were all kinds of connections between these firms before the lead up to it, even during World War II. I mean, essentially, they were traitorous uh, to to our own country, uh, and they were doing it because there was money to be made. There was pressure to deliver uh, profits to the shareholders. And I think that's the kind of uncomfortable truth. And in a way, i got to say, I think we're all a little bit complicit because, yeah, I mean, we want our portfolios to do well. And how willing are we to take responsibility for the fact that, you know, our investments may be, for example, perpetuating war uh, or poverty or, or terror in the world? I mean, these are the kind of big discussions we have to have what are our values well russ what, where does where does the line come and i i uh, have this argument by the way if you're in chicago i'll be happy to discuss it with because i got an interesting group of people we argue with uh well, usually over an adult beverage uh there, there's somehow people people have this mentality that it's if you and i i mean if if, if, if pti does something my firm which you know we're honest as the day is long but if we do something or if any kind of benefit we get out of somebody which we never have gotten Somehow we don't deserve it, or something, something. And I should always be, uh, you know, so beneficial to my client, which which, which I'm going to do anyway. But at some level, all the board members at Bank America need to worry about is the bottom line. Somehow people have gotten this idea that the further up the chain you go, they don't need any morality. Their their, their entire morality is to the bottom line. But at my level and your level, hey, you can't have this guy telling lies on stocks and jacks. You can't have you know. I mean, wh- where where is the where is the line here where the morality changes? And somehow we've we've managed to condition people that that's okay. That somebody can be a, a screw up on the on the West Wells Fargo board, and she can be Secretary of Tr- Transportation the next day. There's no yet. You know, if that happened to you or me, that would never happen. Uh, well, I mean, well, f- first of all, there is the truth that we expect companies to perform well financially. Uh, and there is a tremendous amount of pressure to be fair about it. I mean, if, if, if somebody's a, at a high level in Goldman Sachs, it's their job to uh, do well for Goldman Sachs and, and those who benefit from it. And, uh, you know, if they can get a favor because they know somebody in the administration or cycle their people through this revolving door, I mean, why wouldn't they do it? You, you can hardly blame them because that is business. I would say uh, two things. Number one, um, I think that leaders of all organizations have to be pressured to uh, consider the greater good to some extent. I don't think, you know, there is the uh, fiduciary duty, and as you probably know, uh, a lot of these people actually would get in trouble if they were too civic-minded. Because they, it could, they, it could be argued that they weren't doing their, you know, their primary job, which was to make money for shareholders. So it's a problem the way that it's baked in. But this is where, you know, we get in the whole discussion, you know, is there too much government and so on. I mean, this is where government comes in. Government comes in and says, you know, I understand why you have a, a monopoly. I understand why you have a cartel because it's good for you. I understand that. But it's not good for the rest of us. And we simply cannot allow it. And that kind of tension, 
I believe is very, very healthy. Now, it's interesting to look at the Trump administration because Trump came in uh, railing against these established uh, uh, orders and, and talking about the swamp and the corruption in Washington. But if you look at what he's actually doing, I mean, he has more than, I think, any president turn the government over to very, very wealthy people who are deregulating everything and allowing all of themselves and their buddies to just go tromping right through the field. Well, the, the uh, person before him maybe had, I'm going to say, somewhat of the right idea, but had absolutely no, no, no idea of the details to the point where, I mean, they, their attitude was that businesses are, I mean, and again, I'm in, I'm in the middle on this because I think you need, I'm from the trading floor, so I think you, you need to design things to where things are competitive because if it's, if it's competitive, you don't need very many rules because people watch, watch themselves. Once it starts not being competitive, you've got a problem. You know, so in, in my opinion, you no. Know, so I mean, you you don't you can't give loans to people if every time somebody gives a loan, somebody from the government is looking over your shoulder. You'd never build a bridge if every time somebody's welding a, a joint, somebody's standing next to them watching them. I mean, there, there's a there's a level where the Obama administration felt that the only reason why a plane doesn't fall out of the sky is because because they're watching the United Mechanics. No, planes aren't going to fall out of the sky because a it's bad business and b most people have a, some conscience. <coughs> I think you know. So I mean, so they went way too far in a, in a very poor way. They, they they did regulation, but it was it was all after the barn was was done. I mean, all they did was harass people. Which well, you know, he, well, that's an interesting point. And of course, uh, you know, I think we've all had experiences with bureaucrats and regulations and frustration. It's a very very difficult act. And what you're describing, of course, is this kind of swing. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll tell you what'll happen. You know, Trump will do whatever Trump does, and then there will be a reaction. Uh, publicly, uh, because it's particularly with these elections being so close, uh, you can you can always have you know half the population more or less on one side, half on the other. But there's just enough people uh, that need to switch their votes, and then the other side comes in, and then you get a reaction. And so uh, you know all of these things are going to happen, and they're going to say, "Oh my God, you know he's, he can't handle disasters properly. Uh, they don't have good decision making going on. Uh, you know uh, you, you're going to have more uh, you know made offs." Situations, uh, you're going to have more bubbles and collapses and things, and nobody wants that either. I agree with you. I mean, being a president and 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 more uh, uh, being the people behind the president, the people who try to shape these things, is really a tremendous responsibility to try to get it right. Because really, uh, it, the, the role of of a, of a successful government is is to, as you say, to foster competition, real competition. It's kind of like being uh, you know a ref. Uh, in wrestling, right. you know, yeah. I mean, you, you know, when when somebody's doing something, they that really that is not okay. They jump in and they separate them, yeah. <laughs> and they try to get the thing going the right way again. Well, that's, I think it has. But I mean, I've seen some stuff on on my end. I mean, again, I, I'd love to talk to you for a while. I've seen, I mean, my uh, my significant others in the, in the real estate business. Somebody somewhere in the last five years has decided when you go get a mortgage, if you don't have if you don't have a job job. That you can't get a mortgage. If, if you you could be a plumber making a hundred grand for the last forty years, that's not good enough because you don't you don't have a W two. Yet people with W twos get fired. I mean, somebody somewhere, some bureaucrat, nameless, faceless, has made that call. Why? I mean, what, I mean, what, what, I mean, I, I mean, I, I have some clients here that I've had, that have had to liquidate accounts. Guys have got more money than God because they they have a, a you know they're consultants. Oh no, that's not good enough. You, you can't you can't use your income. You got to pay cash for this place. I mean, who, I mean, who makes these calls, Russ? I mean, it, it's, I mean, the, the, some of these decisions come out of these bureaucrats like there's no tomorrow. Well, you know, you know, uh, Tom. I mean, as a journalist, what I do is I look into exactly the kind of thing you said. You know, you'll say to us, "Hey, who makes these calls?" And we'll say, "Let us find out." So we go and we start asking around, and I can tell you, in case after case, I'm surprised at the answer. So, for example, uh, you know, the, 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 let's say the banks, they may say, you know, we're doing this because the government makes us do it. We go and we look at the government and try to find out what happened, and, the, and people inside the government, they say, listen, you know why we do this? Because we were pressured by the industry to require this. Oh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised, yeah. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't say I knew the answer. I said somebody. somebody I mean, <laughs> well, this is this is why journalism is so critical. You know, this is why you need that kind of vigilance. I mean, I started who what why with nothing. I mean, you talk about a startup. You know, doing things the honest way. I, I literally. I mean, I just. 
I, I basically, uh, you know, used credit cards and stuff, went into debt to get the thing going. And uh, it's been a struggle. We are growing. You know, we're trying to do what we can. We don't have the resources of these big news organizations. But our whole attitude is to be agnostic, to say, we don't know. Hey, that's a great question he asked. Can we put somebody on that project and try to find out? The public needs people who really represent them. And I think in, in an ideal world, that's what journalism is supposed to do. We're supposed to represent the public interest. We're supposed to be the people's detectives. We're supposed to go out for the people, for Kathleen, for Tom, who have questions about things and want to know, and we're supposed to find out. Well, where do you think this, uh, uh, the big question, even though I've taken you off, off the road as I usually do, uh, where's this Russian thing going to land? Well, you know, I mean, when we started looking at the Russia thing in 2016, I, I think we were wary of it. We were skeptical, and I believe that's a good position for journalism. There were these narratives that start catching on. Uh, there are memes, you know, they're fads, they're whatever they are, and, and you start getting a pack mentality, and we see this all the time with the media. There's some narrative forms, and you read the Washington Post, you read the New York Times, you watch CNN, and they all more or less are presenting it the same way. You know, Saddam Hussein of web, has weapons of mass destruction, we have to go in. Well, no, he didn't. I mean, pretty big screw up there with a lot of consequences and, and a lot of people died and so whatever it is you have to be careful having said that uh... we were very very cautious at who what why dot org but by the, sometime in the spring we were like wow what are we looking at here and kathleen earlier asked about these figures felix sater uh... uh, uh michael cohen and so on. these are these are guys who we started looking at very early and i'm very proud of what we've done uh, and we started looking at these people who were around surrounding Donald Trump. Uh, but this isn't just about the campaign. This is about these guys who were involved with him years ago. And this is about how the Trump organization came to rely on people and monies associated in some way with the countries of the former Soviet Union, I would say with the larger uh, uh, ecosystem of a small number of people who managed with the end of communism to grab a lot, had a lot, had connections. Uh, they became what they call the oligarchs, and and this I think is what we're looking at. And so uh, I I believe it's real. I believe it's of grave concern. I think what Mueller's doing is very important. Uh, I'm concerned that he's not going to be able to go all the way with his investigation because uh, what we talked about earlier, these shocks are too big for the system. And imagine that they discovered that the President of the United States uh, was in the pocket of uh, oligarchs or of another country. And I'm not saying he is, but let's say they discovered that. What are they going to do? I mean, that is a, a trauma. Imagine how the markets would respond. I mean, these are things that they really have to think very, very carefully well, Russ, about. Russ, I'm going to go, go south side mentality here. And I, you might think I'm nuts. If, if you go build, put up a hotel in, in Moscow and all these guys want their peace and you regrettably have to pay them off, like being in Chicago, not much different, really. Uh, I'm, I, yeah, I mean, I, I wish it wasn't like that, but I don't have a problem with it necessarily. But if it turns around that all of a sudden I don't have money for my place and I borrow money from the oligarch, now I got a problem. I mean, does that mean me being too south side? I, I don't care if they come up and say Donald Trump has paid twenty million dollars in bribes over the years overseas. You know what? I don't think I, that's what they're finding. I don't think that's. I'm saying I don't yeah. think that's what they're finding. If they find out that he owes all these guys all these places, then I got an issue with it. I mean, I, or am I wrong on that? Well, I mean, it, it sure looks like uh, uh, like he's got a problem in that regard because, you know, and then that pattern of behavior where he was consistently so complimentary of Putin and so unable to even acknowledge the most basic problems. I mean, he was, he, you know, you remember some of those public statements yeah. he was trying to present, you know, uh, Russia is a very happy situation. I mean, uh, no, I mean, uh, there, uh, there really is a very strong authoritarian problem there. Uh, uh, journalists are, are shot down. Uh, the, uh, the, Putin's personal enemies are bad things happen to them. I mean, this is yeah. a really problematical situation there. And for the President of the United States not to be able to acknowledge any of that, you have to ask, he, I mean, it either means he's incredibly ignorant, which is, I think, probably part of it, but it's also just that uh, he's got some situation there where he can't talk about this stuff. And to your point, uh, you know, the, the evidence is out there. The, the statements from the uh, from Donald Jr. and Ivanka themselves talking about the, how, how important the former Soviet Union was to the Trump organization. I mean, there it is. Russ, how about giving yourself a shameless plug? And we're going to talk about the labor numbers in a bit. 
Sure. Uh, who, what, why, dot org. Uh, we'd love to have people come and sign up for a newsletter. Uh, if you support our work, uh, you can uh, donate. It's uh, tax deductible. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, who, what, why, and also on Facebook. Whenever you come to Chicago, you're going to come see us? I'd love to do that. <laughs> that sounds great. That sounds great, buddy. Thank you very much, as usual.